Back to you, Calvin. I want to hear more about moving from green to other frontiers. You know, if this conference happened last week, I wouldn't be able to say anything. We just did our results announcement last week, so we're in blackout. Um, I, I think that what you're alluding to is this discussion about um, green finance, and we've heard uh, some organizations start to issue things such as sustainable development bonds, sustainability bonds, social bonds, and so forth. Um, you know, being an issuer two years ago uh, was very helpful because at that time nobody knew really in Asia well, what, what this was about. Um, and the challenges that we ran into, we, we went over to Europe to actually do a roadshow to investors. Um, and at that time, one of the biggest issues was that investors actually didn't know who Hong Kong is or yeah, who, who Hong Kong is, what we are. Um, they kind of tie us into mainland. Um, they don't think that Hong Kong is, is a, I guess, a, a first world city. Um, that, that's actually kind of interesting and amazing. Um, but going through that process and getting them to understand who we are has certainly opened up the markets. Um, at that time, our green bond, we had about 96%, 96% were Asian investors, 4% were European investors, despite us going out there to doing a roadshow. Um, if you follow with MTR, uh, Swire, Towngas, uh, and I think New World is, is, is the latest one, uh, that percentage of European investors has increased from 4% up to about 30 to 40%. So from an issuer's perspective, you do have a benefit to diversify your investor base, and we've seen that change. Um, the other thing about being one of the first uh, issuers is now, we're dealing with something that we did not anticipate, or I'm dealing with something I did not anticipate, and this is that investors are calling me. Investors are calling me to follow up on our green bond. Most of you who are in the finance sector do understand uh, that typically when you buy debt, you buy it and you take the coupons and that's it. You know, There's really no follow-up. So one of my selling points for, for the green bond was, hey, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll sell it, uh, investors will buy it, and then there's really not much follow-up. Uh, that was an understatement. Um, so in the last year, or sorry, no, even in the last, since January, so six months, in the last six months, I've had at least um, almost 10 calls from investors around the world. Um, and that's 10 more than I've ever had in the last six years. Uh, they're all, they're asking us specifically, hey, you, we bought your green bond, and I want to know how you're performing. We've issued a use of proceeds, and we've said how we will do this. Um, but they're calling to say, prove it, tell me, I need information. Um, so fortunately, because we issue our annual report and we report in there, I thought I was off the hook and said, hey, it's all in the annual report, uh, we've listed it all out. That's not enough. They're asking about, has a project been completed? Um, and we want proof that the project's been completed. Um, and my response was, wait a minute, you're, I, I actually asked them up front, I'm not very politically correct. I asked investor, hey, I, I'm glad you've asked these questions because this is good for me, I get job security, okay? Um, because nobody else in my company will answer this question. Um, then, the, then I asked them, look, you guys are on the debt side, you're buying our debt and you're really, there's really no need or incentive for you to be an active investor. Um, if you're not happy, what are you going to do? You're still getting our, you know, 2.875%. And they said, you know what, that's correct. However, we do have a green investment mandate. And what that means is that we will follow up with you. Um, we will make sure that you're doing what you said in use of proceeds. If you don't, we will divest. And then my response was, okay, uh, if you divest, then you divest, we don't control that. And then they also said, we, when we divest, if we divest from Linkrete, um, we will also issue a statement saying why we as a green company or a green investment mandate why we bought into LinkRead and why we are divesting from LinkRead. No one's divested from us, okay? Let me, let me get that straight first. No one's divested from us. But they, they did say, look, we will issue a statement saying that we, so-and-so investor, decided to divest from LinkRead because they did not follow their use of proceeds. Or we do not feel that their, um, their, that their use of proceeds is used as effectively as other green bonds around the market. So you sit back in, and I'm sitting there smiling all across my face thinking, yep, I have job security. This is great, <laughs> absolutely great. Um, but the last question that they asked me wasn't just about use of proceeds, it was about impact. And that's something that we did not address in our use of proceeds. But they're, they're asking, okay, what is the impact of your projects? Um, and then uh, they explained that, look, within a year, 
So for any of the other issuers in this room, within about a year, you will get calls from investors asking about the impact of your green bond. Um, they were asking for hours, and my response was, well, you know, I'm not sure how you build properties in Europe, but in Hong Kong, we typically take longer than 18 months to build a property. So we were able to push that back a little bit. But this also gives me impetus to start monitoring some of the social issues, some of the environmental issues, some of even the governance issues that our uh, building hopefully can influence. And that leads into exactly what you were kind of alluding to, social impact, um, environmental impact, sustainability impact. Um, we are at the cusp of issuing green finance, green bonds for environmental pr uh, purposes. But the questions that investors are asking exceed beyond that environmental side. They're asking about the social impact. Uh, I do believe that we will eventually transition towards sustainable uh, and, and, and social bonds. Um, I think Robin mentioned earlier that hey, this is opening up a whole new area for expertise. We're going to need verifiers. We're going to need universities to train students, uh, particularly in the business school, to train students and environmental schools. Uh, we need to have this cross-departmental -depart training. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity coming up from that. Well, thanks so much for that. I, I'm going to segue with uh, Ben. And I know, Ben, you talk to a lot of investors. And what's your take on what uh, Calvin has just said? Really, as, as, as a former banker, I hear that and I say, oh, no, my, in the, if the issu any issuers in the room are going to be freaking out about all this reporting that Calvin is talking about. Uh, again, uh, I, I love the story. I mean, the credit matrix is not just good enough. You need now to have an ESG matrix, and investors are, uh, for, for, for the sake of the security of their investment for the next 10 years, look at the sustainable side to further reinforce their credit decision. Two, it's not that bad. There, there is, uh, it's not like in the equity market where we have active investors, you know, trying to push you to be even more sustainable. I mean, when you get into this uh, green bond or green finance uh, product, it's true you have investors which are very engaged. And, and for the company, it's definitely a reputational issue. You need not to engage into any green financing instrument if you're not at company level, at board level, convinced that your company is either already strong on the ESG or, I will argue, companies which are the desire to transition, are not strong, but want to transition and finding investors to accompany them in a kind of energy transition or social transition. Here it's a pure aim. I think we can find financiers for that. But uh, the beauty of Calvin want tomorrow to do a bond issue. Okay, speak to banks, but now he has 10 investors he can call saying, hey guys, I'm gonna do a bond. If I do a bond, will you join me? And I'm sure that even without banks, he can find, you know, half of his order book, and he can have a kind of security to know that his transaction will work. So I think it's a very comfortable position to be in. Two, um, you have, you use the word, so I'll take it again, a various shade of green. Uh, you have the investors which have been in this market for the last 10 years, which started in ESG on the equity side, created green fund, are marketing to pension funds, their capacity to invest in green. These guys, uh, which we can qualify as dark green, uh, will um, select projects on ESG basis, then look at credit metrics. Two, you have a second phase, which is lighter green, which are issuers which have started to hire ESG analysts which are started to put green bond investment framework, which are, for example, on the ALM side, on the asset and liability management side of the issuer, looking to first they've issued a bond. Now the investment side is thinking, ah, we've issued. Let's look maybe at greening our investment criteria. So we have this kind of lighter investors, and I will say that, or lighter investor, lighter green investors. And this is, for me, the part which is very much growing. And that's great because we need these kind of guys to start to get engaged. Then they become much more professional, and they become dark green investors. But there is a process which takes two to three years, you know, to, to, to green uh, uh, an ILM department. I'm sure in your organization you are greening every department one by one. You're convincing them to, to join the green bandwagon. In a bank, same thing. 
uh, I'm lucky enough to be in, in a bank which believe in, in green finance, but we still have people, you know, in the organization which still think it's a buzzword, uh, which doesn't see the value. So even in, in committed organization, you know, you have a lot of lobby work to do uh, to engage to engage the people. So on the investor side, it's growing. It used to be a European story. It used to be a US story, though with the new administration in the US, we're starting to see less attraction in green financing coming from the US. But in Europe, that's why you have a lot of euro denominated transaction on green bond. But it's also an Asia story. And like everything else in Asia, it's faster. So what took five, six, seven years of development in Europe, it's taking two to three years in uh, Asia. So we've seen quite a lot of issuers. And guess what? For the last 12 months and for the upcoming 18 months, I'm seeing a lot of investors which are looking at uh, greening their investment criteria. So I actually want to follow up on a really quick comment that you just made right there about um, having this culture built through the entire business. A green bond is actually one of the best ways to do this. And I found that this is very inclusive in the sense that you're taking your finance, so now that our treasury and our finance team is involved in this, sustainability team uh, has certainly been part of this. But uh, for a property perspective, we've gotten our uh, operations team uh, involved on this, our marketing, our CCD. Um, they're all actually aligned on this. They all have a little bit to play, uh, their little role in a green bond. And this certainly has helped build the culture in our business. Um, and this is probably a very good opportunity for any future issuers to consider how do you galvanize your entire team around one project. Um, I can't really think of too many projects that, that do that um, at a business level, but this is certainly our experience um, in, in doing that. So that was one of the best things that we got out of it. And one from a governance point of view, one advice we give to our client when we want them to issue green bond, selection of asset is key. And we advise them to do a, a, a council, a sustainability council, where you have people of each department and, and the people which are producing in, on your side, you said the operation, the guys building the, the, the building. In a bank, it will be the guys generating the assets, so the bankers from each product line, the real estate, the shipping, all the industry you know, being part of this council. And they put forward present each project that they have. And then, uh, collectively, they decide or not if it's eligible to the criteria that we've put forward. And usually, we give a veto right to the head of sustainability, which ultimately is the one who can stop a project to be considered as green or not. And then this creates a pool of assets, which can be refinanced through a green bond. So it's uh -huh. very inclusive, indeed. That's a great discussion. Calvin, I, uh, I want to build up on the point you made on, on impact measurement. And, and I'm going to ask my colleague, and Teller, who's done quite a bit of research on impact measurement. So, do we now have the tools and tell it to actually measure impact of uh, green projects? On the okay, overall, I think we have the tools. So not on the green, but I'm talking about any kind of assets in the market. You can measure the impact. You can measure along the ESG, or you can measure along the SDG. ESG becomes more internal to the company's operation or is more applicable for asset, asset manager and asset owners. You can really see the impact on the price on, from a pricing perspective. Uh, SDG is more how the, what, it's a way can of communication. Can you explain for the... For the uh, uh, SDG is a sustainable, sustainable development goals set up from um, UN, United Nations. There are 70 goals. Uh, they are quite broad. So, but a, it, it proved to be even more wider, uh, uh, to get even more wider application than it was initially set up for. And because it is very w clear and concise way of communicating to the market, to the investors, what the company, what is the footprint of the company in terms of environment, in terms of water, life underwater, life above water, um, pollution, poverty, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it's kind of, at this stage, it's still external. So it's what the company's footprint is on these areas, and, uh, but it's not what the company is doing, how to improve the footprint. So it's just one-way information. ESG is a more solid um, impact, I'll call it, impact measurement and internalization, internalization of what is the environmental impact and how you internalize that on your business model. So how you improve based on ES, ES and G. 
for the green aspect, it can be done the same way. You look the environment KPIs and you price them in. And that goes in the credit rating as well. So you want to see on the sovereign level as well as on a company level. So ESG, you apply from where the company is located. So on a country level, ESG, and then on a, on a, on a company level, ESG. I think the framework is there. What is more worrisome, in other words, what is more the market development now is like China will have its own KPIs and um, other market users will have other KPIs to look at within their environment, within the social, within the governance. So they look at more localized KPIs to measure and report and internalize, and that's part of governance, say. But then the way we look at governance will be more other aspects. Like I was there in Beijing last Friday, and they mentioned to me they localize the KPIs. So on the governance aspect, they look at, instead of business ethics, which will look at it as part of governance, they look at technology innovation, which is not exactly the same. It's not easy a uh, substitute for that. So it's, <laughs> then you look at G, but what is in the, inside G for China is not our G here. So for asset managers, asset owners, and companies, depending on where they are located and how they incorporate that impact is very key. So don't look at just impact on the high level. We have to know what exactly are they measuring and how are they internalizing that. I've seen that Hannah is bumping up and down to make some comments. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to come on in on this point about impact measurement, because it is a bit of a theme that seems to be very, very current. Whereas two years ago, I'd ask clients if they wanted to measure their impact, they'd look blankly at me, whereas now they're coming to me and saying, you know, how do we measure our impact? And here's the challenge. I think back in the days when we were speaking mostly about climate bonds, when you're looking at something very tangible like a wind farm or an energy efficiency project and you can relatively easily measure the number of tons of carbon that you've saved, relatively easy to measure your impact. As the range of different types of green finance products expands and you're talking about, one's talking about SDG bonds, sustainable development gold bonds, social bonds, it becomes more and more difficult to measure impact. It's equally as important, but it's more difficult. Um, this may be a brave thing to say at an academic conference, but I think it's important we don't get too academic about this. We're not just academic. We're, We're not just, just like academic. Like okay, in that case, I'm disciplinary uh, <laughs> cooperation here. Thank you for clarifying. Well, in that case, I feel safe saying it. I have a concern, actually, about what Calvin has said, because not every organisation has a Calvin to think very deeply about these things. And not every organisation is lucky enough to have a Calvin. I wouldn't want issuers to be put off by the thought that they're going to have to do very, very onerous impact measurement. And I think we're still in the early days, particularly for the more innovative types of social and SDG bonds and so on. But I do hope that the industry will come up with, and I do believe the industry will come up with a practical way of measuring impact in a reliable way. Because whilst green bonds and particularly social bonds and other bonds remain very bespoke and special, equals expensive and difficult for the issuers. So I think if we can get some kind of harmonization around various things, but including impact measurement, that would be a good thing. Ben, what do you think? I, I think I completely agree. We shouldn't scare issuers, because at the moment, we are at 1, one to 2% of the market being green. And we need a minimum size, and the minimum size will be 10 to 20%. And if we put too much high trigger, high barriers, there is a lot of issuers which will give up. So no, we need to encourage, of course, the best practice, but we need to make sure we get more people, we get more raw material. Having said that, it's true, we, we see the same. Two years ago, three years ago, we will have had a company saying, okay, I have five projects, it's five buildings, it's a, a, a railway, uh, I'm financing that through my green bond, and then one year, two years, three years later, I'm reporting on it. I am doing a nice PowerPoint slide saying the project is completed on time. This transport X Y Z. This is a green building. Okay, it will be more descriptive. Now we see much more. Okay, we've saved X Y Z ton of carbon. We've created during the project 10,000 jobs. Uh, we didn't have any accident. You look at banks. We do. We do lend money to finance green projects. So what we do, we say thanks to our loans, XYZ jobs have been created. And this helps investors which need to report. And in France, for example, there is uh, what we call the Article 173. All investors, institutional investors in France need to report on CSR and the impact of their investment. So they are putting pressure on us 
to tell them uh, how much, uh, to give them KPIs, which are quantifiable, so they can put them in their report, and they're putting pressure on us to help our clients, you know, give concrete example of, of what's being done. So harmonization, indeed, so there's quite a lot of working group on harmonization. Uh, there is one in the Nordics, for example, the Nordic agencies, which are trying to put together their own standards. But then I think, thanks to Mushtaq and Ikma, I hope uh, there will be more standardization in this kind of process. But overall, I think we are going in the right direction. All right. I, I would like to give uh, you, audience, the opportunity to ask questions. We have a gentleman here. Um, I like to, my name is Alex Fong. I'd like to pull together some uh, thoughts that was given. First of all, not all organizations have a Kelvin. We all know that. Secondly, scale is important, and we all know that. Right? Now, my question is, if you look at, at the situation in Hong Kong, you look at the top 30 companies, you know, they probably have something very rigorous about sustainability, finance, right? But you go the deeper down to the small, small guys, <laughs> family business, non-listed, private companies, and, and everybody's struggling to try to penetrate that level. I come from that level. So my question is, how do you relate this to tax? Because if for the small companies, you can get tax rebates from ESG reports, for example, then it's a very practical thing. So any thinking from the panel on how to relate ESG to tax? That's my question. Tax rebates. A tough question. Um, <laughs> let, let, let me answer in a slightly oblique way. So you may or may not be aware the Hong Kong government actually has a grant scheme. There's not a tax rebate, but, but a grant scheme for issuers doing green bonds to help with the certification and the professional services help that they'll need at the very beginning. Is it enough? Well, I can tell you it's slightly more than Singapore's similar one. <laughs> Um, I think the question is, what, what, what would be the incentives that would encourage people on an ongoing basis? Because that's, that's a one-off beginning uh, grant program. But I think it's very important. But the other thing I would say, and I think this is a general point, and it, as well as relating to your question, green finance is not just about green bonds. There are other ways to think of green finance other than by having a, a large green bond program which has very onerous reporting requirements and so on. So, for example, green loans, as has already been said, standards are being developed around that. And that's something which I think administrat administratively should be more straightforward than green bonds. But even just at a very basic level, things like energy efficiency financing or participating in emissions trading, these can be done at, at a smaller scale and maybe more appropriate for the small, smaller cap companies, which I think are characteristic of the Hong Kong market, a very high proportion of the smaller cap companies. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Lady here. Hi, um, I'm Andrea Leung. I'm from RS Group, a family office based in Hong Kong. Um, thank you very much. Very enlightening and fascinating discussion, and also including the panel uh, speakers and panelists this morning. Um, I have a one que I have one question, and also uh, for Kelvin, and also um, comments for for further discussion. Um, Kevin, you mentioned that uh, you are receiving more and more questions and requests from investors asking for impact of the proceeds of the pro um, project. Um, and you mentioned that your green bonds, most of the investors were from Asia and some from European. I like to ask you, are you seeing the trend of um, you know, asking about the impact from Asia? And also, um, how do you see the impact investing um, or broadly sustainable investing coming up in Asia? Um, impact is, is really getting hot in, in Asia. And I just came back from a big conference in Singapore about philanthropy, uh, blending philanthropy together with um, sustainable investing. Um, while well, giving a little bit of background, uh, RS Group is one of the leading invest, uh, impact investors in Hong Kong, and RS Group incubated um, sustainable finance initiative, basically um, seeing the trend and also seeing the need um, of educating investors based in Hong Kong and also Asia to, to, to basically blend the sustainability DNA into their investments. So, um, your comment would be very um, 
helpful to address the, this. And also, um, Ben, um, you you also mentioned about uh, not not to um, scare um, the issuers. And I also would like to get your your um, um, perspective that how are you seeing the private investors coming in into um, green bonds or sustainability bonds and um, market? Okay, let me try and answer that question. Um, the first thing I, d I do want to uh, reemphasize, I absolutely agree with Hannah and Ben, um, that we, we don't want to scare uh, people. Uh, we don't want them to think that, hey, investors are asking for um, um, impact assessments, um, but they are. However, the caveat I forgot to add was that they're, the investors that I spoke to actually aren't sure what how do you measure that impact? So they're open to us for ideas. So as, a, as an earlier issuer, uh, you certainly have the opportunity to shape what does impact assessment mean. Um, and I think this also is a good opportunity to point out that sometimes we have to look at things from a different perspective. I would argue that all the companies in Hong Kong, let's say at least the top 30, um, ha do very well in community relations, uh, building up the communities around them and so forth, and have these CSR initiatives. That in itself is already an impact, which they could possibly talk about when they issue a, a green bond. Um, back to your question about um, investors, they're all still coming from Europe. Um, all of them, all 10 of them were all from Europe um, because you know, they, they have a lot more follow-up right now. Um, I can turn the tables and say, you know, unfortunately in Asia, we don't have as many um, active, uh, and when I mean active, I, I don't use in the same term of activist investors, but active investors such as RS Group who have helped shape what sustainable and responsible finance is. Um, I think that as we get more of the uh, more of you guys out uh, in Asia and and talking about what this is about, um, we should hopefully we'll have more questioning uh, questions from the Asia region. Um, I think that was that answered all of your questions, right? Okay. And to to complement, yesterday we organized uh, because we are in a kind of Green Week in Hong Kong, uh, an event where we had twelve issuers. Six being global, like the IFCs, the Nordic Investment Bank, and six being Hong Kongese and Asian, to meet with 20 investors. Five global, 15 being local. Out of the 15 local I, Hong Kong-based investors, I had three which had a proven track of green investment, and three others which are putting in place uh, green mandate and all of that happened in the last six months so I think in the Hong Kong market institutional investors are definitely getting into the bandwagon. Issuer side it's been three years two to three years now the investors have learned I've seen there is more offering they get into it so that's the institutional the big boy game if you go into more retail more family office more uh, private banks um, it's I think natively a topic which is made for this kind of clientele. You are in a family office, the young generation want okay, to invest the money, but they want to invest it for good. So the product uh, are, it, it, in Japan we have an example which is the Uridashi market, where we sell to retail a financial product with a return, but usually a third of the offering which is made to the Japanese investors is linked to a thematic. So the African Development Bank trying to fight hunger in Africa, uh, the ADB funding water program. So the investors, they buy a product, but they also buy a product knowing their money will be investing in this kind of project. So we need to do more education with, with private banks. We may also need to do more financial engineering because what I would love is a family office or at a private bank level, a private bank telling me my client are very concerned about this problem in society. Can you find me companies which can, with their private investment, help to resolve this problem and doing this kind of bilateral financing? So we need a family office or a private bank network because one or two million, unfortunately, is not enough. I need a 10 to 20 million to create a financial product, but I think we are definitely going this way. All right, I think we are coming to the end uh, of our conference. Christine, can you come and uh, wrap things up for us? Well, I do think today has been a tremendously rich uh, discussion, touching actually many points relating to green finance that in no way can we kind of chop, chop, uh, finish. 
but nevertheless, I think the chop chop approach is is good because you know we get a, it's it's like a great buffet. Um, but what is necessary is for those of us who are in our specific sector to kind of go back and drill deeper. So I think today, um, uh, at least I think on behalf of HKUST, we can pledge that we would do more of these events. Uh, we will also take the ideas, your questions, and the learning back to the universities. Our scholars will crunch them a bit. So hopefully that every time we're able to advance the subject a little. But of course, we cannot advance it without the practitioners. Uh, and we are very grateful that many of you are willing to work with us. So we look forward to seeing you again. Hopefully, in the not distant future, uh, we'll be able to continue crunching these truly fascinating and important issues. So thank you all. Thank you, Professor Fu, from coming down from Guangzhou and the panelists from the first session. Thank you. <laughs>